on behalf of Tata Trusts and the Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations, ICRIAR, we welcome you all to this international conference on values in foreign policy, interests, and ideals. This conference over the next one and a half days would witness stimulating discussions on the role of values in formulation of foreign policies of several important countries. I request all of you to kindly keep your mobile phones either switched off or in the silent mode while the conference is on. For the inaugural session, uh, we have on the dais Sanjay Pulipaka, who would be chairing the session, Dhara Snowden, Pawan K. Varma, who is an author, a diplomat, a former member of parliament, and H.K. Dua, who is former chief editor, an ambassador, and a member of parliament. Over to you, Mr. Pulipaka. Good morning. Uh, warm welcome to all the speakers, chairpersons, and participants. Uh, we are delighted that uh, Shri Pawan Verma and Shri H.K. Dua have agreed to share their views in the inaugural session here. This project uh, was conceived about two, point, about two and a half years ago. Uh, we are very happy that the CREA is hosting it and Tata Trust is supporting the project. Uh, in, when we talk about values and foreign policy, we are not defining values as good and bad, uh, as binary opposites, rather than as principles that guide, tend to guide foreign policy. Uh, the project has a couple of important components. So we had a writer's workshop in March 2018 uh, to reflect on values in foreign policy. The proceedings of the workshop uh, are getting published in the form of an edited volume, and uh, Krishnan, James Mail, Professor James Mail, and I are editing it. There are about 14 chap chapters in that, and uh, Robert Kaplan has also written foreword for the book. Roman Littlefield. Uh, is publishing it, and uh, we had a very good experience working with Dara Snowden, who is sitting right next to me here. Uh, I'm sure some of you have already received the details of the book. We are also running a website on values and foreign policy. We had about more than 45 writers uh, contributing to the website. The third component of the project is this conference, uh, wherein we have invited uh, researchers, policymakers, and others uh, from various parts of the world some of whom have contributed to the book and some uh, who have not contributed to the book, but uh, who are experts in their respective domains. We are planning to come out with a small report of, the, of this conference. And uh, without for taking further time, uh, may I request uh, Dara Snowden to speak for about five minutes. Good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Dara Snowden, and I am the Senior Commissioning Editor for Politics uh, and Security Studies at Roman and Littlefield International. Uh, we are a global publisher with offices in the UK and the US, specializing in the social sciences, international relations, and politics. Uh, we are passionate about bringing together academics, professionals, and policymakers um, to discuss and navigate important world issues. I'm very happy to be here in such a learned gathering of diplomatic experts and academics today, uh, and publishing a book with considerable Indian involvement. Um, involvement and support. Uh, this edited collection, publishing in two weeks' time, um, examines values in diplomacy in depth and, importantly, uh, with a very wide geographical coverage uh, from the US in the West uh, to Japan in the East. Um, this, this, in this respect, it is very original in its offering and will no doubt be uh, and attract a lot of great attention uh, since it's relevant for the contemporary world, which is changing rapidly. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and insights over the next day and a half, um, and will personally take away from this conference knowledge and an understanding that will help guide my participation at international book fairs and gatherings and seminars that I attend. Uh, thank you for organizing and attending this event, uh, and I will hand it back over to Sanjay. Thank you, Dara. Uh, now we move on to Sri Pawan K. Verma. As you all know, he's a well-known author, diplomat, and former member of parliament. Dua Sab, Sanjay Ji, Dara Snowden, Ambassador Krishinivasan, and this very distinguished gathering of 
experts on foreign policy and international relations. It gives me great pleasure to speak at the inaugural session on a subject which as any practicing diplomat or a member of a country's foreign service or diplomatic service, any member must have over a period of time thought about. I had the privilege of being in the foreign service before I resigned to join politics. And at some point or the other, you do ask your question that is foreign policy a mechanical or artificial construct? Is it conjured, as it were, from a vacuum and a set package handed to you? Or is it more organically rooted in some legacy or inheritance and the two, in a sense, are inextricable? What, you, what value system you give to your foreign policy, and I propose to rest this thesis with you, derives essentially from your historical experience and your subjective realities. And the two, when they come together, make for an organic, authentic foreign policy that is followed by with conviction. Because unless that connect is there, foreign policy cannot be some kind of artificially created paradigm emanating from a vacuum. Now, if you were to isolate some elements of a value system that has animated Indian foreign policy at least, and I propose to use that as a template. I think one of the first values, if you like it, that we sought to infuse foreign policy with was the right to have an independent point of view on issues that affect India in the diplomatic arena. By that I mean that on every issue there needs to be by each country the scope, the freedom, the enabling environment to apply its mind for application of mind so that you come up with a point of view which represents your your thinking on what the world should be like. Now, why was this rooted, this, this conviction that India as an independent nation must have a voice which represents its point of view and that that point of view has the right to be heard. That in itself was important for newly independent countries. Not only that they say they have a point of view, but for that point of view to have an institutional forum and sanction to be heard. And that I think stems from the fact that India may have been a newly independent country, a young nation, but it's an exceptionally ancient civilization. Defined by antiquity, by continuity, by assimilation, by diversity, and by peaks of refinement going back 5,000 years. Now, when such a civilization metamorphs into a young nation with all the experience of this long journey going back to the dawn of time, then this country, which is also a civilization, wants to assert its legitimate belief that what it thinks matters to the world. And therefore, the right of nations to be heard must be an in, 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 inalienable and inherent right in the world for all nations to have. So, once again, I am trying to make a correlation 
between historical circumstance and subjective reality and what constitutes the value system of foreign policies. A second element to my mind was our belief in terms of an absolute value, was our belief that international relations must be governed by a notion of unalterable equality. Equality between nations and equality of opportunity for nations. I think both are important. One is equality as under law and the other is to create an environment where there is equality of opportunity. And once again I was thinking, I was looking at some of the discussions that preceded 1947. And while the leaders of our freedom movement were discussing the kind of India India should be if it gained independence, and these got enshrined then in the Constitution of India. One issue that was the subject of prolonged discussion even in the Constituent Assembly was that of universal franchise. Now you may find the two somewhat unrelated, but essentially they represent a common source of thinking that ultimately shapes a value. In the Constituent Assembly, there were many who felt that there should be qualified franchise and that that franchise should be restricted or linked to people with a certain level of education. Only they should have full franchise. And this was opposed very strongly by people like Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, who became in many ways an architect an architect of our foreign policy and its value system, who believed that in a democracy, irrespective of any other factor, all citizens of the republic must have universal franchise and therefore the principle of equality must be untrammeled, unqualified, unadulterated and absolutely unquestioned. Now, that was the thinking. And that got enshrined then in our approach also to the Committee of Nations, that there is must be equality, that you may be more strong, that you may be more powerful, that you may be richer. But in the world, when we meet, we meet as equals representing different nations. Similarly, with equality of opportunity, there was again a great discussion in the Constituent Assembly about affirmative action. By affirmative action is meant what we now call reservation, that there will be inequalities in the world, but in order to create a level playing field, each country must be provided with equality of opportunity and where that does not exist, countries must work to provide an environment where there is equality of opportunity. And that principle in our internal socio-political system got enshrined in the constitution through the policy of reservations for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes who were the subject of millennia of discrimination. So the notion of equality in international relations also is, stems from the subjective realities and the historical legacies of the country. Uh, a third element and which has had its pluses and minuses for us has been the emphasis on peace. Uh, as you, I need hardly say, for a country that gained its freedom move, gained its independence through a freedom movement based on the principle of ahimsa or non-violence. The espousal of peace as a consequence of international relations has to become an important value system unto itself. And uh, I think uh, one of the offshoots of this became, uh, the several offshoots, but at least one of them became our 
strong commitment to uh, disarmament, a world free of nuclear weapons. And we took it to unrealistic limits, in my view. Uh, few nations will countenance or believe the fact that a country that developed the capacity to build nuclear weapons in 1974 in one of the most troubled regions of the world with a competing power like China already having nuclear weapons voluntarily forsook that, voluntarily abdicated that ability for close to two and a half decades. Purely on the assumption that a peace, a world where peace is guaranteed and mutual annihilation is excluded is important as a value unto itself. Another consequence of that perhaps is uh, uh, an undue pacifism we have shown on many occasions in the conduct of diplomacy and our relations with countries. Uh, a pacifism that uh, is far removed from what uh, any self-respecting nation should pursue. In my personal view, for instance, after when Kargil happened, and I've written about this in my book, uh, Janakya's New Manifesto, and elsewhere, I believe that when there was uh, intrusion into our territory during the Kargil operation and that it went on for months and we had verifiable evidence of intrusion into our territory and those who had so intruded were at the commanding heights in Kargil and to evict them would lead to the certain death of thousands of hundreds of our young soldiers and officers. Then instead of running around to the chancelleries of the world to show what admirable restraint we can exercise, any self-respecting countries with body bags arriving in its capital on a daily basis as a consequence of that intrusion which can be verifiably shown would have definitely gone across and sealed the line of control so that supplies to those intruders are cut off. Any self-respecting nation would have done that. But we chose the other option of trying to prove our credentials of admirable restraint because of our great principle that India on its own will not become an attacking power, subverting peace. We went around the chancelleries of the world and then we saw literally a thousand of our young soldiers and officers we lost in the attempt to evict those who had occupied the commanding vantage positions in Kargil and then actually called it a victory. This is a version of logic. So in my view, it has consequences as well in terms of pacifism, but uh, peace, peace remains uh, uh, an important aspect of... Uh, a fourth issue that I think... Uh, informs our foreign policy as a value unto itself is the freedom of movement of peoples and goods. Uh, again, uh, as a relatively poorer nation with a great deal of human asset, uh, the right for people to migrate freely from one country to another in accordance with prevailing laws was important for us. But it is also, interestingly enough, an important aspect of Article 19 of the Constitution, where across India, the right for any citizen of India to settle and pursue any occupation is a guaranteed fundamental right. Please compare constitutions of the world, which are written constitutions, and try and see in how many of them this right is enshrined as a fundamental right. So what we did internally, and that, that's the real point I'm trying to make, there is a correlation between how you, the, the historical experience that you have had and what you do internally and what animates you internally between what you do externally. This again 
is, uh, is an important aspect. A fifth point, and I'm just really making pointers given the time available, uh, is uh, uh, we, we believe in the importance as a value of consensus building. Indians are incorrigible consensus builders. Uh, you put uh, them in a room, they draft well, they are, come, they, 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 they are prone to come to a compromise far faster than most countries. Uh, they are not ideological jihadis. Uh, they would rather find a way to co-opt each other's point of view between the antithesis and the thesis to, to, to find a synthesis and, and, uh, and, and to our modus vivendi and move on. And that's why our diplomats are very prized uh, in international forums for, if nothing else, their skills as, as draftsmen who are able to, 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 to affect the slate of hand where each side believes that their point of view has been incorporated in the manner in which a sentence has been drafted. But anyway, consensus building is something again which is, which is an aspect of our historical legacy. We have had invasions, we have had outsiders come in, we have had assimilation, we have been able to find meeting grounds, meeting grounds between people of very different origins and even different points of view. Uh, Akbar the Great tried to create a world religion called the Deen Ilahi by getting people from different faiths to sit around and this was in medieval times. Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, Gandhiji could play arbiter between different points of view in his immediate circle, whether it's that between Sardar Patel and Nehru, or if you were to look even between Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose and Nehru, and so on and so forth. I, I, there are too many examples I can give. This is discussed in some detail in my book, Being Indian. But no, the, the, this ability of, of an of an importance on its own merits of consensus building has been an important aspect of our value system and it is definitely rooted in the fact that we are the world's biggest democracy that brings many strands together. Uh, a sixth uh, aspect is uh, our belief that international relations must accept diversity of opinion diversity of people, of cultures, uh, and we have said this very often at UNESCO. And I think that, uh, uh, again, uh, this, this, this completely reflects the nature of India, which is a country with a considerable amount of diversity, but underpinned by a unity. And whether it was now or otherwise, I mean, if you travel across India, whether it's, it's language, it's, it's culture, it's, it's sartorial wear, it's culinary choices, uh, you will see a, a great deal of diversity that often stuns the foreign observer. But what is interesting is that under the underlying that diversity is a unity that takes a little longer to discover, but it's nevertheless verifiably there. And that is why, from the time of the Upanishads, about roughly 4,000 years ago, we said, Ekam Sat Vipraha Bahuda Vadanti. The truth is one, wise people call it by different names. Accepting the fact that there is diversity, we said, Ano Bhadraha Kratavo Yantu Vishwata. Let good thoughts come to us from all directions. Because all directions that they come from are important and that there is no uniformity that can be imposed by fiat on a diversity that is enriching. Udhar charitanam vasudeva kutumbukum For the wide, for the big hearted, the world itself is a family and that family therefore is one that constitutes many strands of opinion coming together as part of one global family. So I believe uh, these are two, uh, this, this too is an important aspect. I will end by saying that 
uh, one, one aspect that has influenced the value system of our foreign policy is about neighborhood. <laughs> neighborhood uh, because uh, uh, you will be quite surprised how imp the importance uh, sociologists have vouched for it, anthropologists have vouched for it, how important in the Indian way of thinking is to have a sense of goodwill and peace prevailing in your immediate neighborhood. Even the gods are invoked to provide that. I am not saying that we have succeeded. There is an old Chinese saying, why do you hate me? I have not helped you which often kicks in where our relations with neighbors are concerned. And it's not an easy task. Uh, and, and we have problems. But I think that has been a value system again inherited over a period of time. Uh, and lastly, on environment. We may not be the most clean country ourselves, but on uh, essentially uh, an environment that is, uh, in terms of climate change and all the efforts that are going on for a better environment, I think there are more Sanskrit shlokas relating to an ecologically cleaner environment as one subject than on almost anything else. And I think that's an aspect that will always remain close to our heart. So I want to end by saying that I have tried at least and I have always felt that foreign policy is very closely related in terms of its value systems to what a country's historical memory, historical experience and historical legacy has been. And when you add that to its subjective realities with which it is grappling on a daily basis, even as it forges a foreign policy, then you will begin to make the correlation between the choices we make. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Shri Pavan Varmaji. Many thanks for bringing out some of the values that seem to be defining India's uh, external economic engagement, external foreign policy or uh, external en engagement. Uh, now we move on to Shri uh, H.K. Duva. Uh, former Chief Editor, Ambassador, and Member of Parliament. My friend Pawan Verma, Sanjay, Tower. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, I to make it supposed to make a few remarks, but uh, I fully agree with what uh, Pavan has said. But before that, I will say the timing of the, this event, I wish it was a few days earlier. You would not have heard the worrying of the war, war planes. <laughs> you have heard if you have arrived two days earlier along the border. And war games were being played with total uncertainty. But nevertheless, I think the wiser council are prevailing. Maybe they heard that we are meeting here today. <laughs> you know, such meetings are important. The theme is universal. Unfortunately, it is relevant in any time. So not to hear the war, war noises or the war planes in the air or sh shooting down of the planes and all that kind of unseemly news uh, could be avoided if wiser councils had prevailed. Pavan talked about the genesis of Indian foreign policy and how it is rooted. Frankly speaking, our foreign policy is based on 100 years of freedom struggle in which Many ideas flowered, some ideas died, some went ahead. But one idea that survived, which needs to be strengthened further, occasionally it comes to understand the idea of India. To which Nehru subscribed, Mahatma Gandhi is inspired, but people like Ravindranath Tagore 
He combined idea of India with the idea of a better world. And that's why he wrote extensively on internationalism, universalism. He was the first to prominently use the word universalism in the Indian context and in the world context. He had traveled a lot, he thought a lot, he thought besides writing good poetry, painting, music, and all that, he was a thinker also about the world and about India. And these ideas were discussed by Tagore in separate dialogue with Mahatma Gandhi. The famous pictures are available of that dialogue in Vishu Bharati, sitting under a tree. They used to discuss these ideas. And these ideas have been discussed universally also. And there have been voices in the world which speaks of sense, how the world should be a better place to live. So what you are discussing today is, if I, I, in, we wanted to build a new independent country on the idea of India, it has the universal idea, whereas one person is not able to discriminated. And Gandhiji used to say that your task is not over till the last tear of the loneliest and the lost is wiped off. You know, you, it's not, task is not over. And I imagine this idea which as Pavan tried to do on the universal scale. Why not idea of, universal idea of a better world? That somewhere the blocks are there. We also have the idea of India as a block. We are couple, sometimes this comes under strain, but India's inherent strength prevails. In 70 years, this idea of, idea of India has come under strain. And of course, idea of a universal, better human, better world, is only last century saw two world wars. Then some ideas emerged how to conduct world affairs without wars. United, European Union, of course, was one idea that emerged, let's join hands. France and Germany generally were a source of the two world wars and so much of catastrophic events that took place. France and Germany got together. They got better idea at that time. Okay, why not sort it out, create a bigger, bigger world, a bit, bit bigger Europe, where tensions don't lead to wars. Of course, it's that, that idea is also understand the Brexit is taking place, which is which was a, which is avoidable, I think. But uh, there are interests, various interests. I hope still better council will prevail, but I don't know what happens to Brexit. Now, but United Nations was the idea that came, which has worked on fairly well, but not that well, and requires a little updating. But the idea of the plural society in India, the idea of India, it still comes under strain because there are some other philosophies based on, again, on sectoral considerations which should not take place. But I have a feeling the idea of India will survive and the idea of the better world which your conference agenda prescribes will also prevail. But a few things need to be done. Pavan being a practitioner of diplomacy, Would, if, if you give him time, if not rush to some TV channel or push in an article with an editor, he would have spelt out his uh, idea of war should have to be abolished as, as, as means of settling disputes between one nation and another. How do you, how do you abolish it? Well, we had an example of Ashoka. He, he fought a Kalinga battle won it, but he didn't like the killings. Now, how do you have war without killings? But he was a sensitive mind. Buddhism at that time had come into, come out with, with the better ideas. And Pavan Varvava comes from the state from where Buddha came. Now, after Kalinga, he decided not to fight any war. It's one man's decision. And he ruled for quite some years. He talked of Akbar. He didn't want inter-religious inter clashes, which, uh, which our country sometimes is notorious with, which, we are, which is obstructing the flowering of the idea of, of India. Now, idea of the world, frankly speaking, started 
blooming after the devastation caused by the Second World War and we came with the United Nations. Are the institutions which were created, post-war institutions which were created in the world, haven't they got little outdated and needs to be built upon, need to be built upon? I think this conference should consider that those institutions which which were created at the post-war, post-Second World War, are they really valid or there's something wanting which needs to be improved so that another war doesn't take place and the universal peace prevails? The UN itself is, you see, you cannot have so much of diversity of uh, cultures and nations and all that, which Pavan pointed it out, unless the institutions which are serving the world fairly well so far, are they still valid? Are they still effective? So you need to some, give some thought to it. What needs to be done to improve United Nations? How effective it can be? But it has to be effective only when it is democratized. It is not a power play, Security Council is a power game being played there. The geopolitical interest, the big powers influence in the United Nations through Security Council and other means, I think that needs to be re-looked into. Not in favor of one country, not in favor of another country. How does it benefit every country, the poorest of the country? The weakest of the nations also should benefit from the United Nations to the most powerful. Now, it, it, will, it will require downsizing the egos of the big powers, but they will have to do it. It will create a better world. How the resources of the world have to be used for the world benefit, not of a few countries. How technologies which are evolving, how they have to be democratized. All these problems need to be discussed. So far, we have been living with the doctrine of mutual destruction. Is that doctrine still valid? How do you halt it? As Pavan said, well, we have to fight the idea of nuclear, promote the idea of nuclear disarmament. Not disarmament for some and uh, armament for nuclear bombs with some, cons some, some few powers. This, no, there should be no discrimination. Now, nuclear power, now imagine the dangers still posed. More countries have nuclear powers. Others are aspirant nuclear powers. Now, things can go, and why the world moved this time to stop India and Pakistan, pulled away from tensions which could have, in, imagine the nuclear, I can't even imagine nuclear blasts on the Indian subcontinent. It's nobody's interest. Both Pakistan and India will destroy themselves and the impact. In, if pollution can cross the borders, so you imagine the nuclear dust, what havoc it will play. And if Kim and, Kim and Trump come successful, it would be good news in the, that part of Asia is free from nuclear weapons. Obama came out with the right thing. He settled with Iranians, but unfortunately, Donald Trump had different priorities. He walked out of it. Now you are setting in North Korea and destroying chances of denuclearization of Iran's ambitions. That was, a, that was a, not a very forward-looking step by, by, by Trump. Now these are the kind of things which need to be done. Are we prepared for that? We are a, a plural society in India poor and the rich, but we have a lot of agenda yet to be accomplished. 70 years, we have made a lot of progress, but still, like in the rest of the world, education is not available to all, health is not available to all, illiteracy is still there for 26 crore people. Now, jobs are not there. So more effort is needed, and I'm sure it is being done also, and more need. Still it is, whatever you do, it is short because the population increases. So our idea of India cannot be accomplished till 
education is spread, health is available to all, jobs are available to all, poverty is found. Similarly in the world, these tasks are in many parts of the world, poverty prevails. Now, the inequality which is danger to any, any danger to stability within the nations or in the world is still a big danger which the world should attend to. So rather than fighting over national or individual vanities, ultimately it turns out to be that war games are played, or the preparation for war drains away the resources, how much the world is spending, staggering figures, because to promoting markets, create jobs in their own country, sell the weapons to another country, or promote other countries to fight more wars to buy their weapons which are be being made somewhere else at the military-industrial complexes. How do you do it? Now, all those things should be... Promotion of a warlike atmosphere is, in, is more riches for the few countries to make the weapons and sell it. And they generate warlike atmosphere and gain from those wars. So the universal, universalism, which we are going to talk about during the next two days, has to take the practical side. So the too much of income gaps of the rich and the poor at the national level, like India's, or at the world scale, are danger to world peace. You can't have half a, con half a world or one-fourth of the world or one-third of the world rich and gloating with riches and the rest of the world poor and wanting its resources. So those, those, that kind of cooperative atmosphere should be brought about. So from the doctrine of mutual destruction, I think it's better to step up to doctrine of mutual cooperation. That would be much better. How is it to be done? At what scale the effort can be made? But conferences like this definitely are a bit of the seeds of that, of that kind of an effort. More such things to be held. One thing that is often in, uh, we have come across in India particularly, and that happens to talks. Sometimes here we say we would not talk to our neighbor. Now that is a children's way of looking at it. Jagda hua, kati karlo. That's normally the do. I won't talk to this, this man, this boy. He, he, he insulted me. Now look at the a few good things have happened through the talks. Vietnamese and Americans talked at the Hotel Majestic, I think for nearly 500 rounds they had. Chinese and Americans talked at Warsaw. Nobody knew about it, many things that happened there. Americans and Soviet Union were talks, were holding talks at the height of the Cold War. They never stopped talking to each other. Again, I think 463 or 483 rounds of talks they had. And what they were talking, maybe, maybe sometimes shaking hands, have a cup of coffee and move on to their next. But they talked while abused each other. Ten situations were there they handled, but they never closed the door talks. Why not talk when the problems are more serious? That is the time to talk and not say we abjure the talks. Call it one track. Track one or track two, track three, or track four. That is for diplomats to decide. But talking cannot be, without talks, you cannot have peace in the neighborhood. I would like to plead more cooperative atmosphere. That discussion, possibly, you will be having some session for it, economic cooperation. Let us look at the South Asia. What are the problems which is divisive? anywhere in the world were the territorial disputes, water disputes. There's a beautiful book which uh, Pavan would have read by B.J. Vargas, a thinking, thinking kind of editor. One had to learn a lot, and he was my editor also. He wrote, what is the hope? So relevant, and he said, if you if waters of South Asia are shared by the South Asian countries, the fate of one-fifth of humanity 
living in South Asia, we are going to have sessions in South Asia also later. Fate of one-fifth of humanity living in South Asia alone will change. And if it changes for the better, naturally it will be sharing of the water. In this area alone, there's enough water, enough electricity will be produced, enough jobs will be created, and I'm sure the wars also will be abolished with that kind of an effort. But they won't talk. Jawaharlal Nehru once, when uh, he was uh, talking of peace with Pakistan, and that was one of his aims, it didn't work out. We fought wars afterwards, 48 earlier, 65, 71, and always we are sitting on the brink of a war. Ask the people living on the border areas what uncertainty they live in and the growth of the field. Half of the field is there, Pakistan, half of the field in India, and when war begins, they are displaced, both sides. Nehru was accused, why are you seeking peace with Pakistan when they are fighting with us? Why are you shaking hands with it? He said, by shaking hands is a good idea. I may bring tensions down, but to be practical, by shaking hands, you are immobilizing the enemy's hand also, immobilizing one hand. He didn't elaborate, your own hand is also immobilized, but that was for He says, immobilize the other hand by peace, not use two hands for fighting a war. I think that kind of sanity should prevail. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Uh, let me thank uh, Shri Pavan Verma ji and uh, Shri H.K. Dua and of course Dhara Sanoda. This concludes the uh, inaugural session. We will break for a cup of tea and then we will rejoin again uh, for a session on uh, enlightenment and Western foreign policy. Thank you.